Welcome to Profit Boss Radio, where successful women have paved the road to their own financial freedom. Each week, your host, Hillary Hendershot, financial coach, money mindset expert, and experienced wealth manager, will help you discover the keys to the wealth and peace of mind you want and deserve in her no-nonsense and authentic style, starting right now. Welcome to episode 51. Today's episode is an everyday heroine. Her name is Kelly. If you've been listening to the show, you know that I do three types of episodes. One is where I interview experts. In some cases, uh, like in the case of Barbara Stani, we've talked about the emotions of money. Like in the case of economist Dan Ariely, we talked about behavioral finance and why people make money mistakes. And with Caitlin Pyle, we talked about how a side hustle can turn into an amazing successful business. Another type of episode that I do is a solo episode. I share with you my perspective on investments and Wall Street and how to save and how to automate cash flow. That's using my 16 years of experience as a certified financial planner, investments manager, financial advisor. And the third and final type of episode that I do on this show, I call Everyday Heroines. And in this kind of episode, I allow the guest to be anonymous if she prefers. And I tell her story. Together, we tell her story. So these aren't experts. They're not people whose names you'd know or who have brand platforms online, but they're willing to share with you, my audience. And I think that you hearing it in their words can be incredibly powerful. I've just re-listened to today's interview and it's just blew me away. So it's a rather long interview, so I won't take long in the introduction. I'll let you get right to it. I hope you enjoy this episode of Profit Boss Radio. Kelly, welcome to Profit Boss Radio. Thanks for having me. Kelly, would you just start from the beginning and tell us about your first memories of money? Sure. My first memories with money, you know, go back to childhood. I, My mother was the daughter of a banker and my parents tried to instill the value of a dollar in me. How did they do that? By, you know, any money that I got, we put into the bank and I had my little register. And I think at a very young age, I think maybe probably in high school when ATMs came out, you know, I had a checkbook and I had an ATM card and at a young age tried to teach me how to balance my checkbook because that was important to know what was going in, what was going out. And I got frustrated immediately because I could not reconcile my checkbook to the, what the bank said. And your parents, were they middle class or what was? I would say, yeah, upper middle class. You know, I mean, we were very comfortable growing up Great. and still are. So there's money around yeah. and you have this checkbook. They, they're they having you put your money in the, in the bank account mm-hmm. and you can't figure out how to reconcile your checkbook. Yeah. I mean, so it just from a very young age, I felt like a failure. I never really did excelled in math. And, you know, I was much more of a visual, artistic person. So math, I just think from a very young age was something I was never good at. You know, my dad's an engineer. So math homework was always dramatic. And he, you know, did his best to teach me, you know, (laughs) how to get through algebra and all those things. And I just really struggled. So from a very, very young age, money became something that I did not want to focus on. Okay. So you didn't want to focus on it. And what did you make up about yourself when you couldn't reconcile the checkbook and about math and money? What what was your relationship to yourself around money? I felt, I mean, like I said, I felt like a failure. I felt like that idea that I had in my head that I wasn't good at math. I just proved it to myself over and over again. And so I just stopped putting any effort into paying attention to what was in the bank and stopped paying attention to what was coming in or what was going out. And I just, you know, I started to wing it for many, many years. Just kind of threw out the baby with the bathwater, as they say. I wouldn't say, you know, like my parents are great. I love them. We have a very good, loving family, you know, like every family, we're not perfect, but they always tried to instill confidence. And I think... I don't know if I can blame it all on the money thing. I mean, I excelled in many things, particularly in sports, but I think it affected my self-confidence in many ways 
probably in ways that I'm not even fully, haven't even fully realized, but I just felt not good at things. And maybe it was reading too. Like, you know, I just wasn't a stellar student. I got by. And so I think getting by sort of became part of my MO with money. Oh, very interesting. And when did you get your first credit card? Is that kind of when things started to go back? Yeah. So college, went to college, you know, was very fortunate. Father paid for college. So I did not have any of the, you know, school debt. But my role was to stay in college and to go finish my four, which I stretched out to six years. And he continued to pay for it. (laughs) But I had to get a job. And with that job, I also got a credit card. And I had a $750 limit on a Citibank credit card. And I went out and bought Ralph Lauren loafers, you know, back in the 80s. And I thought I was just, it was great. I I wasn't worrying about it. Mm -hmm. And from that credit card back in the late 80s, you know, I carried credit card debt. So you have the one credit card with $750. You bought Ralph Lauren loafers. So mm-hmm. that $750 did not last long. Did not last it, long. So then what happens when you max out the $750? Are you paying it down so, or you get another credit card? So I managed to, and this was, again, a pattern of mine for many years. I managed to, in college, I could pay the minimums and I could pay it off because I had that job. So I paid the minimums, but then there was a summer where I was fortunate enough to go to Italy for school. And I didn't have any extra income to pay my minimums off on my card. So left it with my parents and kind of had to confess that I had this card and, you know, a lot of conversations about they were disappointed in me and, you know, kind of already knew I'd blew it. You know, I already felt like a failure. Yeah. You're like, money. I, so, I, yeah. I, clearly I am a failure. They're just discovering what's true. Tell me something I don't know. Right. Thank you. Yeah. But you know, they were doing, you're their- disappointed in me. I'm disappointed <laughs> in me. Thank you very much. But as a kid, I couldn't articulate it that way, you know? So as a kid, I just, it just sort of reinstilled my inability to deal with money. You know, I think that's interesting. I hadn't even thought about the power of this, your story in particular to teach parents who are listening. So there's people who are listening who are in your situation, but there's also people who are parents and trying to raise daughters and sons who are responsible with money. And it's like, sometimes this information just is not imputed linearly. (laughs) You know, if you're an engineer and you have an artist for a kid, they're maybe not taking it in in that same in the same way you do. It was, yeah, the way I needed to learn was really different. The yeah. way, you know, it's kind of like the way we all need to be loved is a little bit different and what our needs are. So my needs were different than just understanding that there's this register and money in equals money out or doesn't have or money being saved, you know, just savings like... <laughs> I even I couldn't even like think of what that was, you know. <laughs> so you left for Italy and kind of left. How many credit cards were there at that point? So Do you remember the balance? So there was still just the one, and my parents paid it off. And so I came back, you know, three months later, and I had no debt, and it was great. And so I think they did that. They did that to give me a fresh start. Yeah, I know that that was their intention. Unfortunately, I didn't learn anything. Right. So I continued in school. I had, you know, I went through a semester where I was just bouncing checks like crazy. And were you kind of admonishing yourself? Like, kind of like I do when I wake up in the morning, I say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to eat really healthy today. Were you telling yourself like, I'm going to do this money thing this time? No. Oh, I really, no, I really, you know, my parents have their version of the story. I'll tell mine because that's what's <laughs> true to me. Yeah. I really just felt like I didn't want to worry about it. And so it mm-hmm. was something I just sort of closeted away. But were you not worrying about it? For a while, I was able to cruise yeah. because my dad was there. And my dad, you know, it was my education. So that was really important. And he would do anything for my education. I mean, how lucky was I? And so I took advantage of that. Yeah, but I just, and I remember for years, even after college, while I still carried a lot, and this, the debts now increased, even after college, I just, I remember saying to people, yeah, like, you know, I make enough money where I don't really have to worry about it. And that's really great. Meanwhile, I'm just trapped and swimming in debt. 
Yeah. No. Yeah. You can never tell what someone's financial situation is from what they say about it. No. Never. <laughs> I just, I really kind of stuck to that. Like, I just feel better not, not thinking about it, but inside when I'm honest with myself, it was the one thing that really got me. I was stuck for many, many years. You said in our pre-interview chat that I think you used the word entitled. You said mm-hmm. you felt like you had an entitled mindset or attitude as a kid. Do you think, and not to call your parents out because they loved you and did oh, great things course, for you. Of course. But do you think other things your parents did to kind of instill an entitled mindset or did that just, was that just because there was money around? Where do you think that came from? I wouldn't say there was money around. I'd say we were comfortable. I mean, my father's very frugal and, you know, 78 years old and still working full time, you know, so. So I get a lot of questions from people from when I do speaking engagements and mm-hmm. people ask me, you know, how, I mean, it's a big topic of concern for parents. How do we make sure that our kids don't get spoiled? It's a really great word because for me anyways, because I it's my pet peeve when I see someone who feels entitled around money, around their parents, what they might inherit from their parents or something like that. And I feel like for many years, I lived my own lie of entitlement, meaning, yeah, I just got away with stuff. And so I felt to the point that my father would help me, I mean, through college, like once college was over, I was on my own, like, There was nothing more. Mm. I mean, I got to live at home for a little bit after college, but then it was like, as soon as my, you know, college roommate graduated the next semester, I was out, you know, or they were going to start charging rent and electricity. I'm like, well, I might as well go find my own place. (laughs) (laughs) But so, yeah, I think. um, Thanks, mom and dad. I think I'm done. (laughs) Yeah. So I do think I, I definitely was entitled. I felt entitled whether I could fully own that at the time. No. I could not have. Yeah, I mean, I was I was a brat. But looking back, I guess my question is, why do you think? You don't seem like a brat to me. <laughs> How, uh, and there are kids that grow up in moneyed environments that don't end up that way. I think, and this is, you know, stuff with family and stuff like that. I think I was a second child. I never felt, well, not never, but I felt I had a difficult time being heard. So I, and kind of like, you know, we were talking about everyone needs to be loved a certain way. I know my parents did everything they could to help me with money, with love, with confidence, with my sports, with school, with like gave me so many opportunities. But when it came down to asking for help, I was never able to really say what I needed. And so, or articulate what I needed. And so whenever we had those discussions where my parents were disappointed in me or, you know, some like, you know, bouncing checks or whatever it was, I just went back to that place of failure. So this isn't exactly what you're asking about entitled, but (laughs) I don't know how to, I don't know that it was conscious. It was just, I guess I felt my dad would just deal. Not that I felt- Well, and you had some evidence that that was true. Yeah. And not that I felt good about that. But it was your safety net. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I think like looking back, it was an air of entitlement for sure. Okay. At the time, I don't think I felt that way. It was more just, I couldn't- No, it was your reality. Yeah. I couldn't get my head around it. Right. Therefore, I couldn't understand it. So you get out on your own and there's no more help from mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And you had built up some more debt at that point. Yeah. I think I still had my 750. Like I don't even, yeah. Okay. And how did things evolve from there? I think I probably got another credit card at some point and ended up, I mean, the credit cards just kept coming. I was getting offers in the mail because I was paying my minimum. So I never actually had bad credit. I mean, I actually have really good credit. I mean, my credit's amazing now. Yeah. And it was always in the good or excellent. So I kept getting offers. My limits kept getting raised on the credit cards that I had. One of them, I had like a $26,000 limit. And I spent all of that and then kept paying the minimums. And then as I started making more money, I'd try to pay more or I'd get a bonus and I'd try to pay a big chunk, but then I'd run out of cash. And so I just was in this constant cycle of... The debt was growing, still paying the minimums, 
couldn't get out of it. I would get, what are they called? The loans, they're not, you know, you just get a cash loan. Mm -hmm. And I would- Cash advance. Yeah, it wasn't an advance like from my salary or anything, but it was just, yeah, it was a loan of $15,000 from, you know, Citibank or whoever it was. Mm. And, you know, there was interest on it, and but I would pay those off, but I would like- use that to get the credit card down, but then I still had this other payment. So it was just this constant cycle of not paying attention to what was going out and what was coming in. And how high did the debt get? The debt got, I, I think at its highest, it was like 25, sorry, 25, 26,000. It was a lot, $26,000. It was a lot of money and I couldn't really account for anything. It's not like I had a new couch. It's not like I had a new rug. No, you're just or living life. Just, yeah. It was on going out with my friends. It was on, you know, a boozy lunch every now and then. It was just on stuff. And yeah, I could not account. For any of it. And how's it impacting your quality of life? For example, friends, dating? My friends, like my, my close girlfriends knew, but it wasn't like I didn't have any money. So I could still do things. You know, we wanted to go to Asia. We could travel to Asia. I'm just making sure we're going to book it through that travel agent and I can charge it. Right. So I get my credit, my, you know, credit card down enough. So I had enough to charge a couple grand on it and then we could go do that trip. So, and I'd managed to like squirrel away a little bit of cash. So I'd have cash. You know, I mean, I just sort of, made it work. Mm -hmm. So my close girlfriends, you know, didn't care, but none of them had debt, you know, not, they didn't, you know, they just didn't, that wasn't their experience. And they just were much more frugal. Also, I would also have this air of like, I don't really care what things cost because why would I, you know, cause money just, it works on its own. <laughs> so <laughs> well, that's what I know. That's perfect. <laughs> In terms of relationships, I mean, I'm 48, I'm single. Well, I'll be 48 this month. I'm single. I think it, I mean, I don't want to say it's the reason I'm not with someone, but it was something I was extremely embarrassed about. And it's funny, I was embarrassed about it, but at the same time, I went through life thinking, oh, if I could just get married, someone would pay off my debt, you know, which like is so horrible to say and such a horrible, I mean, I can't, it's not who I am today. So it's, you know, thinking that way, you know, there's, there's shame around a lot of that. Yeah. So again, like, I don't want to say that that's the reason I don't, I'm not in a relationship, but it was definitely something that affected my self-esteem, something I was never confident about and knew that, if I really got into a serious relationship, like someone was going to have to help me with this because I couldn't figure it out on my own. You had spent time thinking about how am I going to get out of this? I think what I got from you is that you, you wanted out, but you didn't know how to do it. Yeah. I got into a point with my family where they were going to invest in a vacation home. And my family saw me making a certain amount of money and said, do you want in on it? And at the time, I was trying to think, like, how am I going to get an extra $500 a month to invest in this place? And my brother-in-law, totally well-intentioned, like, you make X amount of money, you should be able to siphon off this money, you know, you should be able to make this work. And I was just kind of like, he doesn't get it. I don't, I don't have that kind of money. And I, I can't just, like, move things around. But I never really let him know that I was like swimming in this debt. And that's why I didn't have any money. But that $500 went to credit card payments every month, you know, it wasn't going to be going to a vacation home. I mean, there were other reasons around that, that it didn't work out. But I, I feel like I had made efforts to meet with people who were in finance, who I thought could help me. And it just nothing was ever do this, do this, do this. You know, I just right. needed some tools. I needed some like actual, like an actual spreadsheet or I needed, I just needed to know what I needed to do to get out of the debt and to pay it off. And no one could help me with that. So you're a very interesting case because a lot of people, the, the shame of the debt keeps them hidden. So they, they cloak it, mm -hmm. they hide it, right? But you had reached out. You had shared with your girlfriends. You mm -hmm. tried to get help from the controller of your company. You reached out to other people. And what you were really looking for was learning, actionable 
training. Yeah. I was looking for help and I was, I feel like, I mean, I would say maybe passively ish, you know, looking for help. Right. It didn't feel urgent. It wasn't urgent because I could have kept going in this pattern. I mean, I'd already been going in this pattern, you know, for, I'm um, okay. So now I'm like 30 years out of high school, you know, for like 25 years. Yeah. I managed that pat or 20 years, I guess I managed that pattern. Yeah. So I could still be doing it today. Had it not been through a series of consequences that led me to To work with Denise. Denise. Okay, so tell me about that. So about five years ago, six years ago, I received a reimbursement check from my 401k. They did some discrimination testing. And so I got like $5,000 back. And my first instinct was like, woohoo, you know, five hundred dollars. But, but that then, was your retirement savings, right? Exactly. It wasn't a and the retire exactly. And the retirement contributing to my four oh one K the maximum amount. When I finally had my first opportunity to do that, I maxed it out because I knew that was the only way I was gonna save is if I never had the money in my hands. So you know, oh, so then they sent you this money. They sent me. You this- had done behavior modification on yourself. Yeah, by make forcing yourself to save, and then they sent you a check for it. And they sent me a check for five grand. So I'm like, wait a minute, this could be way more money when I retire. I don't know what to do with this. And the idea of like a CD or what I, I just, you know, I still barely know that stuff. You know, so I asked a coworker who you know, was more senior than I was. So I'm like, Victoria, what are you going to do with this check? And she goes, Oh, well, I have to talk to my, my money lady, Denise, you know, and she probably didn't call her that, but she said she had to talk (laughs) to my money lady, (laughs) but she said she'd have to talk with Denise. And so I, you know, inquired right away, who's Denise. And this is a coworker who had also introduced me to a therapist years ago, who I went to feeling stuck about things in my life emotionally and money was the underlying thing, but money wasn't the thing that she could help me with. So I mentioned my debt in therapy over the years, but it was never a tangible, solvable thing in therapy. You know, it was talk therapy. So it wasn't like I had homework or anything like that. And it wasn't her thing. You know, she was there to help me see myself as others did, you know, like boost up the confidence, right? Right. So, right. Uh, so, are you saying that you felt when you were in therapy that what you really wanted was help with the money, and what you got was help with other things, or do you see them as being very intertwined? I feel like they're very intertwined. I think going to therapy was a really good thing. It helped me establish like healthier boundaries with family and things like that that I feel like I didn't necessarily have at the time. I felt going into therapy. All my friends think I'm super courageous and see me in a certain way. And I don't always see myself that way. It's just, I don't know. It's just who I am. I mean, people are like, you're kidding. You've traveled the world. You've climbed mountains. You go travel in third world countries that are closed to most of the world. You know, you're so brave because my friends, a lot of my friends wouldn't necessarily do that. Or some of my friends wouldn't necessarily do that. But to me, that's living is just sort of getting away from it all and seeing the world and not having to worry about money and knowing I would be good for a month in Asia because I'd like settled everything and then I could just go experience life. So in therapy, it was really good for certain things. I talked about the money a little bit, but it just, I think after I got to a certain point in therapy where you kind of know you're winding down with a certain therapist, I'm like, okay, I think we got it. I just kind of knew that money thing was still there. Okay. Like I felt better about other things. I felt much better about things with my family. I just, the money thing was still still there. there. By the way, what did you ultimately say to your family about the investment in the vacation home? Did you just say no? It was horrible. I said yes initially, and then I said no. And it caused a rift because they were anticipating on that income to buy this place. So then they were left hanging for that money. Right. So it took a while. They ended up not getting that place. I mean, it's a long, complicated story. We won't go into it here. But yeah, it was tough. So it it was caused, I had to bail. It caused and hardship. I, yeah. And then again, shame, failure on my part. Like, I can't do it. 
trying to make an investment, I can't do it. Right. Okay. So back to how you met Denise. Yes. <laughs> so, sh- so your coworker says, I have to ask my money lady. Mm-hmm. So my coworker says she needs to talk with Denise about what she's going to do with the money. And I questioned, oh, who's Denise? How is, you know, could she help me? Is this someone that could, you know, help me with my stuff? And so, you know, she sent me to her website and I looked around and my coworker definitely gave me, you know, there's some things that you need to be open to. You need to be open to the energy around money. You need to be open to doing some work. You need to be open to wanting to change behaviors. Yes. And I definitely was ready. You know, I've been ready for a long time. I just could not figure it out. So I called her, you know, within the first four minutes of the conversation, I'm bawling, you know, a lot of tears with Denise in <laughs> Denise's office. And we agreed that Denise and I agreed on the phone, just that informational interview that we would be a good fit. So I met with her probably for, I think for about monthly for two and a half, three years. Okay. And this is starting how many years ago? I think I met her in 2011. Okay. So about five years ago. Yeah. 2000. I think it was like May or June of 2011. And at that point, was the debt still around 26,000? Oh, it was maxed. And no savings? No savings. I mean, maybe I had $500, but no savings. Okay. By the way, people get into a lot more debt than 26,000. Oh, I know. Okay. I know. (laughs) And But the other thing too was... You know, rent control department. So my rent was super low. I just, so it wasn't like there wasn't cash moving around. It just wasn't going in intentional places. And I didn't know how to create intention with the money. Right. Cause it's just coming into your checking account. Yeah. You're kind of spending as the bills come in, you per- you're paying your bills. Paying my bills on time. But that's how you're deciding yeah. what job does this dollar get? Well, it depends which bill comes next. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so I think, you know, meeting with Denise early on, you know, she, I talked to her about like, you know, I kind of felt like I was just waiting to be saved you know, waiting, you know, my dad was, wasn't going to do it. He'd already tried it, you know? And so her main thing for me, which was so great is empowering women with money and giving me the tools to get out of the debt, to understand that what I do have is really good. This is how we just need to rework it. Mm -hmm. And so just, she sheds a positive on everything I mean, she's honest too. So, you know, she'll let me know. And I asked her to be honest with me. You know, if you see me, I don't know if we can swear on this, you know, if you like call me out on my crap, you know, just call me out because I had a pattern of not dealing or not wanting to own it or not taking responsibility. So, I mean, because at some point, well, you had the entitled mindset, but at some point you figured out like... I might be kind of screwed here. (laughs) Yeah, because, and what I think it happened, what happened to me just around, I always considered or equated debt with prison. Like I felt very trapped and I felt very limited in terms of what I could do. Well, I could do a trip, you know, a month long trip around, you know, to South America or Asia every other year or something like that. I still couldn't dream any bigger than that. I couldn't, you know, I'd studied in Europe. I'd lived in Europe between college and high school. I love Europe. I love so many aspects of European lifestyle. And I would have loved to find a career in Europe. I mean, I worked in television. It's like there's TVs everywhere. It's not like I couldn't have figured out, you know, brushed up the French, brushed up the Italian and figured out how to work over there. Mm -hmm. But because I had this debt... I just felt so stuck here. I couldn't figure out, well, but it's going to take me a few months to find a job. It might take me six months to find a job. I need money to pay off this debt. Mm -hmm. And so I just felt trapped in my job, trapped in my, and luckily I had a job that I loved. So that was one really good thing. But I often wonder, would I have taken other risks had I not had the debt? So... It's clear that the debt kept you, as you say, in prison. What are the actionable tools that Denise taught you that really shifted things for you? Because part of the work that you're doing 
when things start to shift is yeah. internal and part of it is external. Part of it yeah. is very much like in so, the real world. Mm-hmm. So talk about that. So first things first, the only thing she ever made me do was stop charging on my credit card. That was the only thing she just said, this is a must. For this to work, you have to do that. And I agreed. Thankfully, she gave me the tools to say, here's how you can do that more comfortably, Mm -hmm. you know, instead of just feeling. So tools. She gave me the money minder. That's the spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet. Yeah. I did my money minder this morning. You know, I can now I'm at a place where I can go for two or three weeks and I'm okay, but Mm -hmm. usually not more than two, like three, I get a little stressed out. I have a lot of and still I have a lot of energy around my money minder. If something feels weird, I get a little sweaty or, you know. So she, tell us, can you describe what does the money minder show you? Because people don't know what that yeah, is. Yeah. So the way I, you know, there's a monthly, it's a monthly spreadsheet, but it has all 12 years laid out in little tabs. 12 months. Sorry, 12 months <laughs> laid out in little tabs. And I think at first you just start tracking your spending before you start budgeting because she just needs to see where your where your money's going. And so you're typing in type, yeah, line sorry. item expenses. It's like expenses. an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah. I'm typing in line item expenses for groceries, for hair color, for nails, for, you know, home supplies, mm-hmm. for whatever, you know. And um, did you know how to use Excel when you started? I did. When you got it? Okay. I, I had a rough idea. Okay. I actually do mine in numbers because my computer was so old. <laughs> I had to use numbers. <laughs> Um, okay, so you're tracking expenses. Yeah, so I track my expenses. And then once she got an idea of like how I'm spending my money versus what's coming in and how it's being spent and making sure I was still making my minimums then on my credit cards, then you're able to start budgeting. So then you, if it's, if it's January, you can look out to February before February gets there and start anticipating what your expenses are going to be in February. She also had, there's another tab in the, in the sheet that's called periodics. And those are sort of bigger annual costs that you anticipate throughout the year that you know you need to save for Mm -hmm. car insurance. You know, I put my hair color in there because it's a little bit of an expensive thing. This is what I call lumpy spending. So things like vacations. Exactly. uh, Holiday gifts. Charitable giving. Mm -hmm. Birthdays that are special. Like I have two nieces, so I want to make sure I've got enough money so I can spoil them. You know, yeah, travel, car maintenance, all those kinds of things. Like my ski pass, my, you know, all the things Mm -hmm. that I know are going to be coming that I'm going to need the cash for. So... Very quickly, we started filling that stuff out. And then you just sort of start living by it. Mm -hmm. And you learn how to actualize with what your bank says. And for me, what was great was only having, I used everything in my checking account. And so I was able to actualize this spreadsheet with my checking account. I didn't have like seven things I was trying to track. It was just very simple. And it didn't always equate to zero, but I got comfortable with it enough over time that I could see, oh, well, of course it doesn't equate there. You transpose these numbers or you forgot to enter this. So if I have it right, the money minder is a little bit of a tracker, a little bit of a dashboard, and it's a little bit of kind of like a money map so that you know where your dollars are going, right? And you've said, for example, I need 250 bucks come November 1st for my ski pass. And so I'm going to have savings to match that. Exactly. Just as an example. Exactly. Okay, perfect. And so how much of your conversations with Denise are emotional? How much are you doing kind of, does it look like therapy kind of talking about what money is for you? It feels a lot like therapy, but it's better than therapy. I mean, for years, I actually was like, Denise, my my money person, my therapist, you know, because <laughs> there is a therapeutic element to it. Because one of the first things she said to me was she goes, you know, here's two sides to money. There's your spreadsheet over here and what you're supposed to do logically and intelligently and your rational mind knows that. And then over here, there's like your emotional house, which is all your wants and everything that is driving how you spend money. And unfortunately, if our rational mind, well, and if our rational mind were to be able to trump everything, we'd all be good. We'd all be 
living, you know, debt free and everything. But it's the emotions around money and spending and energy around money that are taking charge. And that was very much the case for me because I refused to pay attention to money and place value on money and what I was spending. The debt got out of control. And so, so we did a lot of work about wants versus needs. I feel like I'm still working on the differences between those sometimes. I mean, that's just going to be like an ongoing thing for me because I think for years I lived without really understanding the difference. Can you give us some really specific example of something you used to spend on that it was hard for you to give up that you don't spend on now? Some area where you're really clear, like, I just don't do that anymore. Okay. Here's like an example. I used to go to REI. I would need some socks for hiking or whatever it was. And I'd go in there thinking I'm going to spend like 20 bucks on some nice. I don't know if everyone has an REI. We'll just say it's It's an outdoor, but it has a reputation for being fairly high priced. Yeah. Camping goods. Camping goods. Yeah. Yeah. And it's an outdoor store. Yeah. And I was going to go in. Lovely (laughs) store. Yeah. And spend like 20 bucks on some nice smart wool socks. And I would go in there and get those smart wool socks. And the next thing I know, I'm walking out with bags of stuff and I'd spent $250. And I don't do that kind of stuff anymore. I would see something I liked. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Pop it in the bag. Oh, a new fleece. Oh, a new hat. Oh, a new whatever. And I would just put it in the bag because I liked it. And I thought that'd be cool to have. And I would buy it, not worrying about how I was actually going to pay for it because it just went into the debt pool. Yeah. It just was so huge. What's another 250 bucks going to do? Sometimes I, I uncover with people... A lot of people have a story about particular expenses, choices that they're making in their life that the, it has to be that way. They have to have that. Yeah. A lot of times it's around kids or health, you know, let's say a homeopathy. So I have to have the acupuncturist. I have to have the herbal remedies. Mm-hmm. I have to have the, I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. Um, and, and in their mind, they really have to have it. Was yeah. there anything like that for you? Okay. The one thing that Denise ever questioned about my expenses was we were looking so year end you meet with Denise and you kind of look at your annual plan like how are you going to be spending your money over the year did you stay to your plan for the last year and it's just sort of it's like looking at the year behind and then looking at the year ahead and I had done my budget for the year ahead and she so gently asked now let's look at your brow budget (laughs) And so, <laughs> your eyebrows? My eyebrows. <laughs> and I was going to get my eyebrows done. I mean, I don't have children. I don't have major medical needs. You know, I mean, so this sounds so superficial, but to me, getting my brows done was really important. And of course, you maybe can tell I haven't had them done in a while. But so I was like, well, Denise, it's my lashes too, you know, because I was getting my lashes tinted as well. So to me, I was really justifying that money. And oh, it took me a while. And she kind of laughed and allowed it to go, you know, just like, let me keep it. Over time, I realized like, I don't need to spend the ridiculous amount of money that I was spending every month. I could go every three months, every, you know, so like, I'm single, I make a good living. I don't, I'm not saving, I don't have children. So I'm not saving for college. So the cash flows there. But I think what you're pointing to is what wasn't present before was we'll call it the value of a dollar. You didn't have a sense of yeah. trade-offs. Right. So you're doing the brows and the lashes and then we're just going to use that as the, t- the token expense. But all the expenses really were yeah. because there isn't for me, if I spend here, I'm not going to be able to have this that I want. It, that just wasn't real for you. It was not at all. Yeah. That And that really is kind of the linchpin. And I think what that money minder makes possible for you and what automation makes possible for my students, it's just a different system I teach, is like you start to see a dollar over here is not over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and exactly. really your dollars are finite. Like wealth is infinite, but the exactly. dollars in your system are finite. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, I'm embarrassed that that is my example, but you know, I, I live a, I live a really good, 
full life. Yeah. And I don't, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> well, I just don't have a lot of expenses for others. Yeah. You know, I mean, I spend money on my nieces and my family when needed and I'm uh, not needed when I want to. Yeah. And I'm not saving for college for kids and things like that. So <laughs> the brows seem a little superficial, but they were important <laughs> at the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So where are we? Well, so I can back up a little bit. So combined with, so tracking the monthly expenses with the money minder, my other major thing that I had to do was get out of my debt and I had to pay that off. Right. And so, so the other thing that Denise did was just give me options, tools to do. So because I had good credit, I was able, instead of having to go to consumer credit counseling to consolidate any kind of debt, because I think I had a couple cards. Yeah, I had like a Bloomingdale's and a Neiman's card and stuff like that. I was able, I didn't have to go through the consolidation, which she laid out as an option, but she had me go put everything on 0% cards. So I got as many 0% cards as I could. And I think I got up to three or four before I got rejected for one. And I was able to then of that, you know, 26, like transfer money over to these cards. So then I wasn't paying interest for a year or two. I'd get the ones with the longest 0% for the longest amount of time. Great. So you found multiple cards that had 0% for a year or more. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And so I was able to then transfer the money over. And I was also concerned, well, wait, my credit is really good. Is this going to make my credit worse? She's like, no, you know, the amount of credit that is going to be your credit that's going to be affected by doing this once it's paid off, you like, it'll all be normaled out. And sure enough, she was right, you know. So that was huge because, and I wasn't able to actually put everything on those 0% cards. So what she taught me to do really clearly was pay off the card first with the highest interest rate yep. and then just pay the minimums on the 0%. So then I was able to finally get that card down to zero because I think there was still like four grand or five grand that I had on a card that I could not get them to lower my interest rate, even though I'd never been late on a payment. They would not lower it. I think it was 12 or 13% and they would just wouldn't budge. So once I got that down, then I could really start seeing the debt, like just tick, tick down, down every month. And, you know, I think I was out of debt like two and a half years, maybe. Wow. It so was, you're paying off over a, oh, about a thousand dollars a month or more. Yeah. Yeah. But I also wasn't spending that thousand dollars a month at sporting right. goods stores on stuff that I didn't need. Or, you know, I also, you know, just did simple things instead of shopping at Whole Foods, I go to Safeway and Trader Joe's or go to Rainbow in the city, which is a co-op and they've got beautiful food, beautiful produce, and it's cheaper. Yeah. And so she just started working around just sort of smarter ways of doing things because I just hadn't cared for so long. Yeah. We did other emotional, like things with the emotions around money. And for me, I think my issues were more just seeing the lack of what was possible in my life and feeling that like slowly digging my way out of prison. And so trying to see, she helped me try to figure out what was possible in my life so I could start dreaming because I hadn't really, I knew I wanted to live abroad, but that just wasn't going to happen with all this debt. That is not necessarily a need or desire I have anymore. I mean, maybe when I retire or something, but I think... What do you mean when you say she helped you figure out what's possible? I mean, it's something I'm still working on, but I just, you know, is, is uh, buying a home something that was an interest to me? Is home ownership interesting to me? Mm -hmm. I have, you know, I've been in my little apartment for 22 years. I don't have a lot of people over. So we did work around figuring out like is home ownership that's something that is important to me or is saving money and maybe sprucing up my little apartment so I can feel proud of living there and then having money to do other things. You know, so it was it was practical work, but it was also just around it gets back to this like what's possible is around like what the wants are. Mm -hmm. Like what do I want in life? Do I want a partner in life? I'm not sure. I don't know. I honestly cannot figure this one out. I know right now I'm not willing to put the energy into it. 
you know, as lazy as that sounds, life is really good without one. So I think it's allowing me to let go of the things that I feel like I should be doing versus the things that I want to be doing. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, so it's you know, been a whole process of like life clarity and organization and the ability to envision and dream and yeah. I mean, and so, you know, there's homework. So some of the homework was vision boards and it's super fun. You know, you're going through magazines, you're cutting out, you know, and since I sort of have this creative side of myself, I'm like, Oh, great ski pictures. And I, I'm an avid skier. I love skiing. So anything with snow. Yes. You know, anything cabiny. Yes. Mountains. Yes. Adventure passports travel. Yes. Like, so I had, I made three vision boards. I made one for adventure and travel one for just myself and valuing me and working on my own self-esteem and confidence and sort of there was like a relationship component to that, but that was a little half-assed. And then the other one was just about my health. You know, I've struggled with weight for many years. And so focusing on weight and, but more like health versus, you know, what the scale says. And so I would say sometimes my attitude towards my health was really similar to my attitude towards money. Yes. Just didn't really want to deal with it. You know, probably my patterns around, you know, my, my weight and money are a little similar. I think for me, the money is a much more tangible thing to manage sometimes. But yeah, you know, it's, it's very similar. There's a lot of emotion around food too. So from a results standpoint, in a little more than two years, you paid off $26,000 in debt. Mm-hmm. And so that was a few years ago. How are things now? So, you know, I did my money minder this morning and things are good because I still meet with Denise yearly. I have goals that I set every year and I'm learning that it's okay when those goals change. I've gone back and forth on wanting a home, but, you know, living in the Bay Area in San Francisco. It's easy to say no to that one. I am debt free. And to buy a place in San Francisco where I want to live, you know, suburbia is great. I don't, but I, again, like without family and need for, you know, multiple parking spaces and all that room, I just, to buy a place in the city, I'm going to get a million dollar dump. And I am not going to feel good about it. (laughs) So to me, that is not important. Yeah. Would I like to buy a place in the mountains in the future? Of course, I would love to do something like that. And then I can keep my little space. I mean, I've, I've also, I mean, I've spent several thousand dollars getting the floors redone, getting it painted, like making it into a home that I feel good about in the city. So that's been really good. I have a savings account. You know, I am still working on Denise wants me to have, you know, $100,000 in savings. Like, what if I lose my job? What if, you know, just that's emergency savings that is separate from the periodics. And I definitely don't have $100,000, but I'm, you know, like Get close, there. <laughs> close. Yeah. So those kinds of things are really empowering and feel good. And you really realize that, oh, just really socking away a little bit every month and budgeting for it and knowing that in my monthly expenses, a thousand dollars has to go into this every month or less or more, depending on what's going on. But I have an annual target that I make every year. And if I can put more in, I do. That is a really healthy habit for me to be in because it's amazing in a couple years how much it's grown and that that feels really good yeah it feels so good i mean so while i don't have my full fund funded it's it feels amazing yeah and that is there's this freedom for me that comes with no debt that i learning still like how you know it's like when you live with it for 20 years in that prison, it's, you know, like people say they have like culture shock when they come out of prison. It's a little bit like that, you know? So <laughs> at times I find myself like a little bit of a kid in a candy store and I know I can play with, you know, money a little bit, but then it's like, I have to get grounded and I have to, and because it took, you know, a couple of years to get out of the debt. I now have this habit of saving and watching where it goes. And like, I will never be back in debt. 
I mean, and now I would say that part of my challenge would be, yeah, well, I don't need a new car right now, but I think about it and I'm not sure I want to incur any more debt. So it's just, again, it's those needs, wants, you know, and so it's just that constant balance of just going back and forth. And it's a conversation that I have in my head with everything. Yeah. In my money life and, and my emotional life too, because, because it's just me, I don't have, I mean, in some ways being single and alone is easier because I don't have someone else's financial needs or desires or wants on my spreadsheet. It's just me. In some ways, it's a little bit harder because I'm solely responsible. But I think, you know, it's the grass isn't always greener, you know, right. but for me, I feel incredible freedom. And like the idea that I can, of what's possible in my life, like what I could do when I retire, is pretty exciting. Yeah. Because I think, you know, because I was so good with my 401k, except for that, that one check, that of course I spent before I even saw Denise, I want to retire providing, you know, everything goes as planned, like, you know, in my early 60s. And that would be really great. That's awesome. Because I have a lot of fun plans that I want to do. You know? Yeah, I can tell you, you want to consume all the experiences that life has to offer. I want to go back and I will stitch this back in. Sure. There was a thing you told me about where your parents put you on a budget and you actually uh, kind yeah. of faked them out. Oh, I totally did. Would yeah. you tell that story? So when I was in college, this was after my check bouncing debacle. I, I think in one semester, I bounced 12 checks. My mother was livid. Understandably. I mean, Again, that's that entitled kid just not paying attention. So my parents wanted a spreadsheet of my expenses every month. And before my dad was going to send me my rent check and my ex my money for my expenses that month, the next month, I had to get my spreadsheet to them. And this is like mail, right? So I had to plan it out in time. So the mail, the check could get back to me in Tucson. I, of course, didn't do it, but I had a pad sort of dedicated to it my yellow pad. I remember it very clearly. And what I would do is not write anything down. But the day before I'd have to mail my expense sheet home to my parents, I'd go around, I collect all these different colored pens, like sometimes even like a highlighter, because I would just be like writing it on the fly. And I, <laughs> and I, so, and I would try and write it in like different positions. So it felt like you had been tracking oh, all my, yeah, just I'm tracking it all the time, just writing it on the fly everywhere I go and really thought I was fooling them. And their comment after the first few was like, wow, that is a lot of big gulps and a lot of popcorn in college. <laughs> you know, it was just, they were mortified. And I mean, they knew it was a bunch of BS. They just, you know, and so those basically faded pretty quickly because it was like a total futile effort. And, you know, and so funny for the parents listening who are trying so hard to like probably making their kids put quarters in the piggy bank and everything in here. Yeah. You know, your parents, it yeah. seems like they kind of they went to task after yeah. a, when they figured out something was wrong and nothing made the difference. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, I had a little bit of income from my job at the deli and I had uh, but I had my, you know, my some my spending money from my dad for meals and stuff like that and groceries but I didn't know how to separate those out. I didn't know how to track that kind of stuff. So I was really just saying, hey, dad, here's what I spent on you. I couldn't tell him how much I was spending on beer because that's what my job was for. My job was literally for my beer, beer money. money. Yeah. And, you know, I, again, like totally privileged life. And I just couldn't get my act together. So, yeah. So the expense sheet was a total... It was another, you know, I felt pretty clever about doing it, but again, it was another total fail in my own mind of as, as funny as it is to look back on it and have a laugh. And we still have laughs about it in my family. It was, yeah, it was like just another one of those notches in the belt that made me like, you're a loser and you can't figure this thing out. Really? I don't know what I could say hopefully that might help someone else. And I don't know how you weave this into anything, but for me on being honest about my money situation and the debt and seeking the help 
was one of the things I'm actually most proud of versus like, I'm super proud of the work and I'm super proud of being able to say that this is who I am now. But I think there are so many people that go through life dealing with debt, but just to seek help, whether it's Khan Academy or anything like that, just there are tools out there. You just kind of have to to look and find them, Mm -hmm. but there are ways to do it. And if you just, if you can commit to it, it happens in a really short amount of time. It can happen in a really short amount of time. Once you decide and take the right action, it happens fast. It happens fast. It seems fast. Yeah. Very good. Amazing. Amazing. Well, I just want to thank you so much for being here. I'm so happy for your success and for what's possible now. And I know that people are going to get a lot out of this conversation. So thank you. Thanks for having me, Hillary. Yeah. It's great to meet you. Profit Boss, do you hate getting unsolicited advice? I kind of do. Whether it's well-intentioned or not, any kind of splaining just feels, I don't know, sort of aggressive and unwelcome. Of course, when I see someone who's important to me and they're struggling, sometimes it's tough to bite my tongue and just be there for them. So it's kind of a conundrum, right? We aren't here to run our friends' lives, no matter how well-qualified we are to do it. On the other hand, if you discover something that's really made a difference to you, don't you just want to share it with everyone? I mean, it would be really presumptuous of me to just assume that my little podcast is something every listener just can't wait to share. But I do know what I hear from my listeners about how Profit Boss Radio has helped them to start changing old money habits and feel more in control and hopeful about getting out in front of their financial security. And I have to think that for every person I've reached, there are thousands more who might feel the same way if they get the chance. So if you're one of my listeners or in our Facebook group and you know at least one or two people in your social network could use an encouraging word, let me invite you to let them know about the podcast and about our Facebook group. Just hit the share button in your podcast app. It'll give you a good feeling, I promise. And you'll be helping me accomplish my big audacious goal of empowering a million women to take charge of their financial futures and become millionaires. Lastly, let me just say I'm truly honored to have earned a place in your busy schedule. I know you've got a lot of demands on your time and attention, and I'm so totally grateful for the little part of it that you share with me. So thank you, and let's get together next week for another episode of PBR. Thank you for listening to Profit Boss Radio, where creating success on our own terms happens every day. You're not alone in your journey to a rich life, and that's why Hillary is here to add value in each and every episode. See you next time on the podcast for women and money.